You're good. You're good to go. All right, we'll go ahead and start up with um, the presentation for this morning. I'll be presenting up here. I know we have some folks joining us online. Thank you so much for joining us online. If you're walking around, please continue to walk around. Please talk to some of the folks at the booth. If you're watching online, the, uh, the expo will go until two o'clock today. So if you want to come by, check it out. There's lots of great stuff to uh, pet and talk to some of the various folks that are uh, hosting the booths. So we'll talk today about a really interesting critter called a moth. And just real quick, my name is Sam Kieschnick. I'm an urban wildlife biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And I love bugs. I love moths. I love all the little critters that exist here with us in space and time. Uh, real quick, if you want to get in contact with me, my email address is right there. I work for Texas Parks and Wildlife. So there's my email address. I'm also on iNaturalist too. I'll talk about that in a second. So the first question that we'll start out with is what exists in your yard? So wherever you are, be it at a park or in your front yard, in your backyard or wherever, there is a universe that exists right in our footsteps. I was talking with one of the presenters earlier about the telescope, the recent web telescope uh, pictures that show the universe way out there. Well, the reality is there's a universe that exists right underneath our feet. So it's just waiting to come, or waiting for us to come and look at it. And a big question that we want to address is what is the importance of moths? And the truth is, if you want birds, you really need moths. So moths at any time in their life, be it at the caterpillar stage, at the cocoon stage, or at the adult stage, are food. They are food for our birds. So moths are crucially, crucially important in the ecosystem. So going back to the relevancy of these critters, relevancy of moths, at each stage they are food. So if we look at the, the food web or the food chain in the outdoors, we'll see that bugs and moths in particular are a crucial part of, of the diets of so many different critters. Now, some of you may say, well, moths, do they chew on my clothes or are they going to eat what I eat to the grains and the cereal. It's true that some of them are pests. Some of them eat our favorite sweater or our favorite hat, perhaps. But in reality, it's very few that do that. So let's look at the life cycle of a moth. We'll start out with the egg. And the egg, a butterfly or a moth, lays an egg on a certain plant, be it a general type of plant or a specific type of plant. They'll lay their egg. In the case of moths, it's typically a lot of eggs. So a lot of eggs will be laid on a specific plant. And the first meal is typically the eggshell. So they will eat that eggshell and uh, that'll be their first meal. And then we have the caterpillar stage or the larval stage of our moth. And the objective for a caterpillar is to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. So that's their purpose in life is to eat and hopefully not get eaten. Many of our caterpillars and our moths are host specific. In other words, they will be on just one type of plant or one species of plant. And again, real quick, if you have any questions or comments, especially online, be sure to put those in the chat. We'll uh, address those later on. Now for our moths, you may have heard of a chrysalis for a butterfly, but for most moths, we call that a cocoon. This is the pupil stage of all moths. And very important when it comes to moths, they have their cocoon or their larval stage in or near the ground. Oops. 
Mel, would you mind going to the next slide? Good. Good. So on behalf of the state of Texas, I will give you permission. I give you permission to leave the leaves. So if the leaves start to fall, you have got full permission to leave the leaves because that's the habitat for many of our moths. They need that leaf litter to form their cocoons or bury them into the ground to protect themselves from the winter or other factors. Okay, let's do the adult stage now. So the, the adult of our moths, much like with butterflies, they have wings, most of them with a few weird exceptions. But the, the adult stage can be quite short for many of our moths. They got all of their energy from the, the larval stage, from the caterpillar stage. So the adult stage may not be too long, in some cases it's just a few days. The scales on our wing, on our, the wings of moths are somewhat unique. They can come off. And the question may be, why would a butterfly or a moth have scales that come off? Yes, they can be very pretty. They can have different patterns. They can reflect the light. But also, if a moth flies into a spider web, it can lose some of those scales and fly right off. I like this, this phrase. And it's from one of my favorite books. So I'm at the library right now and I love books. If you get a chance, and I bet it's here, uh, one of my favorite books is called For Love of Insects. And it talks all about the neat bugs that exist out there. And in it, when they talk about butterflies and moths, they talk about the Romans and the barbarians. That the Romans during that period of time, you had the Romans, which were a specific group, and then everyone else was the barbarian. So if you weren't a Roman, you were a barbarian. The same sort of thing with butterflies and moths. We look at butterflies being the pretty ones, all the other ones that I see, and then all of the ones that aren't butterflies are the barbarians. The reality is the barbarians, that's where all the diversity comes in. So we see a lot of diversity in our moths. So what's the difference? Generally speaking, uh, moths are nocturnal. They're active at, in the evening, at night. Uh, butterflies are typically diurnal or active during the day. Their antenna can be a little bit different too. With most of our butterflies, I think actually all of our butterflies, they have a club antenna. So at the end of their antenna, and I'm not sure if you can see it on the screen there, but at the end of their antenna, they have a little club. And it's a pretty straight looking antenna. We can compare that and contrast that with a moth. The female moths have a pretty straight antenna, and the male moths have filiform or lots of filaments on their antenna. One of the reasons for this is they use those antennas to smell. So if you have a lot more filaments, you'll be able to smell more of the females. And as we talk about some of our moths in a second and look at them, you will see, especially online, if you can tell the difference between a boy and a girl moth. There's a lot more moths than there are butterflies. A lot more moths. Globally, around 160 species of moths. Here in the United States, we have give or take 13,000 species of moths. And in Texas, over 5,000 species of moths. So a lot of moths we have here. So with moths, we have big ones and we have little ones. And we have everything in between with some of them. And that's a huge finger right there. Like the chink of the leaf miner can be very, very small, three to four millimeters, an itty bitty tiny thing. Or we can have a large moth. The largest one that we have here in Texas is called the Black Witch. And it can have a wingspan of over seven inches. So pretty tremendous. And so far um, on a tool that I'll talk about in just a second, uh, over 3,000 species we have documented just in Texas so far. So of the 5,000 that exist, we've documented through this tool of iNaturalist over 3,000 species. 
Okay, so let's look at some of our moths together. And if you remember the difference between a boy and a girl, the boys have these antenna with a lot of filaments on them, so kind of feathery antenna. What do you think? And if they are online, what do you think? Is this a boy or a girl? So I'll give you a second to look at this. And again, we want to look at those antenna. Uh, Mel, have we gotten some responses so far? Not yet. Okay. So is this a boy or is this a girl? What do you think? Do you have a guess? What are girl? So in the room, we got a guess of a boy and exactly right. This is a boy moth with all of the filaments on their antenna. This is a boy polyphemous moth. So it uses all of those extra little sections of the antenna to smell the perfume, smell the pheromones of a girl. Exactly right. Then we have another one called the Luna Moth. Have you seen a Luna Moth before? A few people have seen the Luna Moths uh, before. A really, really neat moth. These caterpillars feed on sweet gum and they also feed on pecans. So things in the walnut family. A weird thing about Luna Moths is as adults, they do not eat. They cannot eat as adults. So they get all of their nutrients from the caterpillar life stage, from the, uh, the larval life stage. So our Luna Moths really just ask me. So how long do they last as adults? A good question. How long do these moths that don't eat last as adults and not very long? This one probably will last an adult maybe a week, maybe a week, so not much time for it to find a mate and to lay eggs. Great question. So another good question from the room, do they drink? And these do not. So they don't eat, they don't drink. They have non-working mouth parts, so vestigial mouth parts that don't work at all. So don't eat, don't drink as adults, but as larvae, as caterpillars, yes, they eat. And then we have our lovely IO moth. And this one, we can see why it's called IO moth. It has those fake eyes on the hind wings. Why do you think we have those? Any guesses? Why do you think? Tim, do you have a guess on why we have those big eyes? I think you're both right. So if I'm a hungry bird, and if I come up to something that looks pretty delicious, but it stares back at me with eyes bigger than my head, I'm gonna fly off. So this is a great defensive mechanism that these IO moths have. And this one, this is a really, really neat one. Tim, have you ever seen one of these before? So Tim, one of the people in the room, an entomologist here in the room has seen one of these once and this Butterfly, this is technically a moth, but it's as pretty as a butterfly, I would argue, even prettier. This one is called the Black Witch, and it has a wingspan of around seven inches. This one has some really neat mythology or lore around it. It's also called Mariposa de Muerte, or Butterfly of Death. The idea is that when you see one, it could mean that it's either a loved one that's coming to visit you, or one that's passed recently that's coming to visit you, it could mean that you're going to win the lottery soon, or it could mean that you're going to die soon. So it's one of those three things, and I'm not sure if you get a chance to, to select which one, but uh, I think the first two are at least kind of charming. So Mary Posa del Muerte is a really, really interesting moth, and we have it here in Texas. Some of our moths fly during the day. So this is one of the ones that flies during the day, this is called the sphinx moth, or the white line of sphinx moth, and it flies around during the day. This is one that does eat and drink as an adult. So it flies around during the day to get that high energy to flap its wings. It needs to get that high octane sugar, the nectar from our plants, but a really, really neat moth. Some of them are just pretty. Uh, this is one that is active sometimes during the day. It also visits flowers. A really, really neat one called the Alianthus web one. This one, it looks quite charming as an adult. It looks charming, 
fuzzy, so pretty as an adult. You might not be familiar with the adult of this, but the young one, Mel, if you take a look at that. There it is. This is the baby of this. And if you're not familiar with these, this is called an asp caterpillar. And they hurt. Holy, holy do they hurt. They have these stinging hairs that anytime you brush up against them, it gives you a healthy sting to keep predators or our little fingers away from it. Some of them can be kind of pests or give you at least the illusion of being a pest. You may have seen some of these big web worms, these colonial forms of caterpillars. Yeah, they'll form this big, big webbing and, and eat all of the leaves in them. Sometimes people ask, well, how do you get rid of these? Should I try to spray these? Well, spray does not work very well for a web like this. What I'd like to tell people is that those caterpillars, after they get to their cycle, they're going to be walking away and they'll be food for birds. So if you can let them be, it's a good thing. Other ones are just very, very pretty. This is one, and nature has played with those scales to form some really cool patterns and some beautiful colors. This one is called the moon seed moth. Worth its weight in gold. Uh, it's not very heavy, but it's, it's a neat, neat moth. So a real quick question. Now, could you go back to that? So are the wings textured like that? Great question from the moon. Thank you so much. So they actually have all of these different bumps and crevices and almost like a mohawk on it there too. These are all scales. So these are little scales that form those different structures and colors and patterns. A great question. Some of them have incredible yoga poses. So I don't know what level yoga pose, probably advanced. Tim, what do you think? This is probably an advanced pose where you're, this is what? Upward moth. That's the yoga pose that we'll go with. The upward moth where your nose touches the rear end. That's an advanced. Advanced takes practice. Um, stretch, stretch before you try this. Um, this is the eggplant leaf roller. I mentioned earlier that some of our moths go after just one type of plant. This one goes after the eggplants or the nightshade. You know, you can see this one pretty easily on a white sheet, but if this one's resting on a branch that has some lichen on it, it is just magnificently camouflaged. So that's one of the ways that our moths stay alive during the day is they find a spot that hopefully looks like what they look like and just stay still. And this one, if it's on a branch with some lichen, some grayish lichen, it blends in perfectly. Speaking of lichen, some of our moths don't eat plants, but they actually eat lichen. This is one called the lichen moth or cystine. Uh, the caterpillars of this group eat the lichen or the fungus uh, and bacteria that is found on some plants. This one is a pretty looking moth. And I like this group. It's called the geometrids or the inch worms. Geo inch or geo earth and metrid measuring. So inch worms measure the earth one inch at a time as they crawl around. So the butterfly or the caterpillar or I'm sorry, the moth here looks pretty incredible, but the caterpillar is mind blowing. Now let's go to the next slide. Do you see it? Do you see? The caterpillar. What this caterpillar does, and you can see it at the top of this flower, this caterpillar does a mind blowing thing. It takes the flower rays, the petals of the flower that it's nibbling on, and it glues it to its back. It glues the flower petals to its back. And what's even more crazy, as those flower petals decay and lose their color, it replaces it with fresh petals. So it's pretty amazing camouflage. Now the next one, there you might be able to see the caterpillar. It takes the flower petals, in this case of a Leatris, glues it onto its back and has this wonderful camouflage as it nibbles on the flower. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Yeah, it's a moth, and you may have to position your head a little bit to see it, but now let's click one more time. This 
might be mimicking a little spider. So if there's something like a praying mantis or an ant coming to nibble on this moth, if it wiggles its wings just right, perhaps it looks a little bit like mimics a spider, something that could potentially hurt a predator of a moth. Another really interesting one, this is called a Chinese tallow leaf miner. Some of the caterpillars will form little mazes in a leaf. And you might see those sometimes as they go in between the epidermis, the outside layer of the moth or of the leaf and nibble on the inside. So moths are fascinating. How can we document moths? And I know I personify it, I throw some emotion on it, but I would argue that they come to your front porch every single night. They are coming to your front porch just waiting for you to look at them. Let's do it. Let's look at them together. Where do you look and when do you look? So where is pretty much anywhere. You can look at them anywhere. You typically want it when it's above 60 degrees. In Texas, this is pretty much year-round. There are some days in February or in January that it will be above 60 degrees. I pop on the lights and look for the moths that come. So why are they attracted to lights? And there's a great book called Why Moths Hate Thomas Edison. And it talks a little bit about those unexplained things out there. We don't know exactly why they come to lights, but they do. Some people think that they're using the lights as sort of like celestial bodies, like stars or the moon to navigate around. Other people think that perhaps it's the moon that's reflecting on a body of water, that that's what looks like a light. And even some other folks say that the, the wavelength of UV stimulates the antenna. Who knows, but for whatever reason, they do come to lights. So if you want to do some mothing, yes, you can use your front porch light, or you can go to a party store. You can get some of those black lights. And rather than going to a rave, you can just toss these on and let the party come to you. So moths can come to you with these black lights. The UV are quite good for it. If you're really into this, um, you can buy some specific lights. Formerly, um, a place called BioQuip would sell those. Uh, they went out of business, so I'm not sure exactly where you can get these. But if you're really into this, there are some places that you can buy these UV lights. And the mercury vapor, super, super bright light, a broad spectrum that can attract a whole bunch of bugs. We like to buy, or we like to use, white sheets. And these white sheets act a little bit like a, a mirror, and they reflect that light all the way back out. So I will use a white sheet, cotton sheet is pretty good, or polyester works too. Basically, that reflects and gives you a good place to look at the moths as they fly around. And then I take a lot of pictures of the moths that I see. So I like to look at them up close. I like to zoom in on them. I will use a headlamp. And then you can either use your camera or you can use a little point sheet. They all work. If you want to, we're at a library now. So there's some great books that exist for moth identification. One of my favorite ones is the Field Guide, the Peterson Field Guide to Moths of Southeastern North America. I mentioned earlier, we have 13,000 species of moths. This one doesn't hit them all, but it gives you a good idea of what's out there. And then there's some great websites to go to as well. There's a website that's devoted to moths. So if you get really into moths, you can visit and bookmark some of these websites. This one's called Moth Photographers Group. You can go through this page, you can scroll through the different moths and get some ideas of what they are. Or you can go to Bug Guide. So Bug Guide is another great website where you can submit photos and they can sometimes be identified by people that are entomologists and specialize in moths. And then my absolute favorite one here is iNaturalist. It is a beautiful tool. It's a community. It's a database. It's also a way that you can identify some of your critters. So I will use this tool. I'll take a picture of a moth. I will put it on iNaturalist and then wait. And hopefully some of the people that exist out there will help me identify it. Not to get too much into the weeds on it, 
But if you want to play with it, um, if you're a kiddo watching online, you need to have your parents' permission or at least borrow their phone and use uh, their address or their uh, username. You go out to a place that has your location, that has your time, and it gives you lots of that down. Happy Moth Week. So today is the first day of National or International Moth Week. And any moth that you observe on a naturalist gets added to the global distribution. So if you're doing it in your backyard in Dallas or in Fort Worth, there are people in Malaysia, people in Kamchatka, people in Zanzibar that are doing the same thing, that are documenting their moths pretty much on a naturalist. Another great book here for moths. If you do get into this big time, putting the, the other plants into your landscape or into your favorite park will bring a whole bunch more moths. So the big question is, who cares? Who cares about moths? They're so important for all the different critters to eat, but also it tells me a little bit about the habitat. If you have a lot of moths, it means that you have got a lot of different plants. And the more plants that we have in the area, the more moths. The more moths, the more birds. The more birds, the more things that they eat the birds. So we have all of these different things that exist just from the foundation of our plants. Native plants are the best for some of our native moths, but any type of diversity of plants is great. And with that, I would love to address any questions either online or in the room about moths. Yes, ma'am. So a great question from the room about Cecropia moths. Cecropia are these big, big moths. Have you ever seen one before? Yeah. So they are a little bit more of a Western species. We sometimes get some of these. Um, I think they feed on sycamore trees, if I'm not mistaken. That's one of the things they feed on, as well as Cecropias, but uh, sycamore trees. And the ones that they go for are really the for the best. So again, Cecropia moths are really, really deep. And I didn't include it in my presentation, but a beautiful big moth. It's also one of those that doesn't have working mouth parts. So as adults, those beautiful moths only live for about a week or so. So they live a lot longer as a cat. Good question. Um, now, were there any questions online? Uh, not yet, but I'll let you know. Okay, okay cool. If there are any other questions. Again, if you have any other questions, oh, yes, ma'am. So a good question right now. If you haven't realized it's warm outside, it is warm and it is dry. A lot of the plants are now crispy and it's a lot harder for caterpillars to form that next stage of life. Let me tell you, I've been doing mothing in my backyard for a while. And this year, the lowest number of moths that I've ever seen that come in my backyard. Other things like beetles and flies are still coming, but very few moths. So a great question about the current ecosystem, the current um, uh, factors, and I think that does impact a lot of moths too. So fingers crossed, I don't know if we want to do a global or a, a, a Texas-wide rain dance. We need to because we need uh, some rain to help with the moths too. Good question. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. Okay, that's right. Again, thank you guys so much for your time today. Again, the, the expo is happening all over the uh, today until two o'clock. So if you get a chance, please come on down if you're watching online. Uh, lots of cool news and neat stuff to see. Again, thank you so much for your time and uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.